So now I'd like to talk about fermentation and the fermentation exercise from lab. So recall from your lecture that if we have a sugar source, our cells have the capability to break that sugar down by a process called glycolysis. In the case of glucose, that glucose eventually is broken down into two three carbon compounds, uh, the exact same ones, and those carbon compounds are called pyruvate. Now normally, in aerobic conditions, in our cells or even in, say, yeast, which is the organism that we used in this experiment, pyruvate can then be used um, to eventually produce acetyl-CoA. That acetyl-CoA can then be used in a citric acid cycle. Um, and the NADH molecules and FADH2 molecules produced during the citric acid cycle, as well as glycolysis, can eventually be used in the electron transport chain to fuel oxidative phosphorylation. Um, but in an instance where there are anaerobic conditions, that is, there's no oxygen, there's also another process that could be performed that's called fermentation. And at least in yeast, during fermentation, when these pyruvate molecules are ultimately converted, we produce, or yeast produce, ethyl alcohol or ethanol. And in the process of performing that fermentation, they also produce carbon dioxide. Now, what's actually happening in addition to this is any NADH that was produced during glycolysis, when we perform fermentation, that NADH is oxidized back to NAD+, which can then be used again in glycolysis. So, in the lab, you looked at yeast, and you looked at yeast's ability to perform fermentation. To do this, what you actually looked at was the amount of carbon dioxide produced by the yeast when we exposed it to one of three different types of solutions. So, a little bit of background. First and foremost, we had yeast, which is a eukaryotic organism. It's a fungus. And then we added it to one of three different solutions. The first solution was water. The second, was 1% glucose solution, and the third was a 1% starch solution. So you took 40 milliliters of each of these and you added them to 0.5 grams of yeast. You mixed it and allowed it to sit at room temperature for five minutes. But in order for us to perform fermentation or to force the yeast to perform fermentation, what we actually need to do is put the yeast in an environment where there's no oxygen. And to do that, we used a special piece of lab glassware called a fermentation tube. So you made your mixture, you poured your mixture into the fermentation tube, and you tilted it back so that all the air bubbles that were in this part of the tube escaped through the mouth here. So at the very end, our fermentation tube should look like this. And now you had graduated marks on the side of your fermentation tube telling you in milliliters how much of the particular product that we were looking at was produced. So you took time point readings at 0, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 
and 40 minutes to see how many milliliters of our product we were producing. Recall that what we were actually measuring in this process was the amount of carbon dioxide the yeast were able to produce. That carbon dioxide would wind up looking like bubbles in the very top of the fermentation tube. So initially, probably at the 10, maybe 20 minute time points, all you really saw in this tube were teeny tiny bubbles that had started to form towards the top. Now I'll talk about where we saw those bubbles in regards to our three solutions in just a second. As time went on, if the yeast were performing large amounts of fermentation, then those bubbles would eventually give way to empty space in the tube. So either the bubbles themselves or the empty space represents the carbon dioxide that's being produced by the yeast. Now, in regards to what would happen in each of these scenarios, let's go ahead and think about it. First and foremost, Recall that on the board I showed you that fermentation is dependent upon the production of pyruvate that's produced during glycolysis. Okay. So that tells us that we at least need some form of chemical energy source. So we're going to need some kind of sugar for us to even have fermentation in the first place. So with our first mixture of yeast and water, we do not expect to see any fermentation because those yeast outside of what they potentially have in them to begin with in, in terms of their cells, they're not going to have access to any kind of sugar source. So they're going to be incapable of performing glycolysis simply on the, on the water. Okay? So in test tube one, we expect to see little to no carbon dioxide produced. So we really expect to see no carbon dioxide produced, um, but on the off chance that the yeast themselves already had some trace amounts of sugar in them, they might produce just a little carbon dioxide. But most likely in your lab you saw no carbon dioxide produced. Which leaves us with the other two solutions our monosaccharide glucose, and our polysaccharide starch. Okay. Now, the monosaccharide is the preferred substance because it's already in a state where the yeast can readily hydrolyze it and produce pyruvate through glycolysis. So, 1% glucose should produce the most carbon dioxide. And that's what you should have seen in your lab, is that this tube of the yeast glucose mixture should have had the most carbon dioxide produced. With starch, we can eventually hydrolyze this molecule into monomers so we're going to produce, uh, basically perform a series of hydrolysis reactions. And after we perform those hydrolysis reactions, then we can actually produce the monomers, which will be glucose molecules. But hydrolysis takes time. So what you should have seen in this final tube was very little carbon dioxide produced. You would see it, and it would probably take a while for you to see it. So most likely, with the glucose tube, you started to see carbon dioxide produced around the 10 minute time point. Even if it was only a little bit, you probably saw it produced around the 10 minute time point, and as time went on, that amount increased, increased, increased. With starch, though, you probably didn't see much in terms of the carbon dioxide produced at all until close to the very end of the experiment. And that's because all of that time leading up to that point was spent by the yeast performing hydrolysis to eventually break that starch down 
into monosaccharides that could be used in glycolysis to produce the pyruvate that would ultimately be used to produce the ethanol and the carbon dioxide. Had we let the tubes go even longer, then eventually you would have seen larger amounts of carbon dioxide produced in those starch mixtures. But because we limited the amount of time, you saw the most carbon dioxide produced in the glucose tube and stray amounts produced in the starch, while you most likely and hopefully saw no carbon dioxide produced in the yeast and water mixture. So that's our fermentation exercise from the lab.